Thank you very much, Amos Yadlin, for his very important words. Um, we will now continue to the second part, a second of the third of the three parts of this e of the conference this evening. We have a very special panel that will be chaired by Ms. Dana Weiss from, chan from TV Channel 2. Along with, with her will be three international experts that have been brought especially for this conference. Dana, I, I, you'll introduce them and invite them to the stage. Dana. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, General Yadlin, for starting off the conversation with Israeli perspective on the changing and challenging environment, uh, and as you laid out the ground, to better understand the rationale behind Israel's policy, and I'll just make it very short. Um, two years after, two and a half years after the um, young people took to the streets in Tahrir Square, uh, is the Israeli policy is to hold tight until the storm blows over and wait for the dust to clear. Um, times of uncertainty, the best thing is to wait and see and protect whatever we have. However, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to Iran, it's a totally different ball game. We see that proactive is the word. Um, Israel cannot sit and wait. That's what we're told. And Israel must take action in time is not on our side, and you can't let time do its stuff like you can do when it comes to Egypt, Syria, or whatever. Well, you know, every prime minister in Israel who enters office quickly discovers that what you see from here is not what you see from there. That's a very famous uh, song in Hebrew that we have, and it's, uh, it takes him no time to walk back from his promises and understand that things are more complicated. So tonight, we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to better understand how our daily headlines and our uh, daily uh, discussion about the events here looks from overseas, uh, and uh, does it indeed look different from Moscow, from Washington, and from uh, Paris? And if there is a message to be heard, what is the message that we should hear tonight? And to help us understand this issue, we are very privileged, privileged to have with us some of the most experienced and well-informed experts on the Middle East, as well as craft, uh, crafters of major politics. The opinion of the distinguished panel, which I will uh, shortly introduce, uh, are heard, respected, and considered by decision makers worldwide. So please uh, help me in uh, inviting to the stage um, Ambassador uh, Jean-David Levit, former advisor of President Jacques Chirac and President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and professor of science politics in Paris. Ambassador, please. <laughs> Is Professor Vitali Namkin with us? Yes, he's over there. He's in the back. Director, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Science. And as you, I think, all know and read and follow, David Ignatius, associate editor of the Washington Post. Please, and I will join you there. Okay, I'm very glad that you joined me on stage, and I just want to set the ground rules where there are no rules. I'll be asking the questions, you can answer, and if you feel a need to interfere, all the better. Okay, so let's start. Um, I think there are a lot of events going on in the region, but I think that whatever happens, nothing can overshadow the um, horrific events in Syria. We're talking about 80,000, some reports talk about 100,000 casualties, over a million refugees, um, and this is, so far, we're still counting. So I want, I want to start with you, Professor Munkin, Munkin, and I want to say this. I think that Russia, unlike the rest of the international community, is standing behind Assad. It seems that way. And is blocking any UN Security Council whatsoever that was trying to find a way to, to find a peaceful or more peaceful um, solution. Can you help us understand this Russian position? I'll try. I can, uh, I'm not responsible for any sort of policy or the absence of policy. And I'm, I'll try to uh, interpret the Russian policy on this issue. First of all, uh, I, I, I'd like to comment a bit on what you said about the refugees and the um, people that were victims of these massacres, uh, where not one side has to be blamed, but all sides, in, in our view, have to be blamed. 
uh, let's not forget that it's not the first time when it happens. The first time it happened several years ago was in Iraq, where during this last 10 years, despite the fact that the alliance uh, forces were there, uh, about 120,000 people were killed, and much more uh, refugees went outside this country uh, than in Syria. Let's not forget about that, because let's be fair. So the, it, it's not in order to, uh, to, to say that uh, Assad is a good ruler because uh, Russia is not supporting Assad or the regime. Uh, I think that in my reading, Russia's position is based on the desire not to allow uh, to repeat the scenario that happened in Libya and very strong inter interventionist uh, position by Russia when Russia felt uh, almost uh, cheated after the, it voted in Security Council. It's not in favor, but let uh, the resolution about no-fly zone but pass. Let me stop you for a second. Why, yeah. why not follow the Libyan precedent? Right. A, not a lot of death. B, at the end of the day, there were elections, and the seculars have gained power. It's, of course, it's going to take time. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not going to happen in a day. But why is the Libya precedent so bad that it shouldn't be followed in Syria? It is bad not only in my view, the view of our policymakers. It's bad in the view of uh, many, uh, for instance, my uh, uh, U.S. colleagues who belong to the uh, realist or neorealist school of thought and uh, they believe that uh, the country is in, in the mess. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people are still there uh, in the state of uh, feeling secure. A lot of uh, weapons are spreading from this region all over the North Africa and uh, even the uh, Sahara and the, even the Sahel region where our French colleagues have to, <coughs> uh, to, to uh, to undertake certain actions in Mali and whatever. So uh, let's see what's going to happen. In general, it helped to change the, 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 the whole uh, architecture, security architecture of the Middle East in a wrong way. And uh, that's why I think Syria is not Libya. And a lot of people are telling this. Uh, so I think that the Russian position is based on certain philosophy, a certain reading of the system of international relations, which will not allow to someone who wants to change a regime because this regime is not favorable to someone's interest so easily by the desire to, especially by supporting these guys, these, uh, you know, jihadists who are committing crimes like in the Boston, uh, during the Boston Marathon. So you, you were mentioning the jihadists, which moves me to David Ignatius, because you were actually, um, you spent time with the rebels which I think Professor would call jihadists. So there is a big question, who are these guys? Are they indeed the extreme jihadists as we hear some of the, the, the security personnel in Israel warn us from what would happen up in the border? And also Professor Numkin says that that is the core of this revolution. It's not what it seems or you think or you saw um, a different future when you look at these rebels. Is there any chance of this unfolding to a democratic, um, West, pro-Western country at the end of the day? With uh, all due respect to Professor Namkin, what bothers me about Russian policy towards Syria is that I think you're almost guaranteeing the outcome that you fear. What I saw when I went uh, briefly into Syria, went to Aleppo, uh, was the following. This was last October, but it hasn't changed. First, you can travel for hours in every direction without seeing Assad's army or encountering a checkpoint, which means, I, I'm sorry, but his authority is gone. Bashar al-Assad will never govern the whole country again. The second thing that you see, unfortunately, is the disorganization of the opposition forces. And I'll, I'll come in a minute to what I think should be done about that. And the third thing, and I, this is I really would underline, is you see the growth of jihadists, jihadists who are actually uh, an offshoot of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, Russia and Professor Napkin are not wrong in warning us of the danger of jihadists taking root in Syria. The problem is that their policies are, 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 are making that jihadist power stronger and stronger. So what can we do about that at this point? But before that, how do you understand that policy? 
I understand that policy being a nominal commitment to transition, supporting the Geneva Declaration uh, that Kofi Annan made when he was the representative, but not doing anything significant diplomatically to achieve it, not doing anything to pressure Bashar al-Assad to leave and uh, make way for people who are part of his government. Uh, the, the leaders of the Syrian opposition have made clear they're prepared to bargain and work with members of Assad's government for a transition that would avoid the disaster of Iraq. And I agree with you, Libya is a disaster. Libya is a mess, and we don't want to see that again. But, but uh, honestly, Professor, I fear that your policies are going to produce that outcome, and it frightens me. Um, just to say one word about, about, about what the U.S. has just decided to do with the support of Britain, France, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all of the countries of the region. The big problem that the opposition has is that it's not a disciplined army. It has no effective command and control, and that's why the jihadists are so strong. The moderates don't have the muscle tissue to hold on. So what the U.S. and others are going to do now is try to train them, train some elite forces, the equivalent of special operations forces that will be able to, to operate more effectively. And I hope over time that will make a difference. But what would make the biggest difference? I said, wrote months ago, and I just would repeat here, I'd love for all of our policies to be to win a Nobel Peace Prize for Vladimir Putin for brokering a settlement in Syria so that this fighting doesn't go on. But your government just doesn't seem to want to step up to that. Do you want to quickly reply? Yes, uh, I can very quickly reply. I think I, I would uh, agree with you that uh, not all uh, opposition, not, not all opposition forces, not all the forces are jihadists, but at the same time, I think we are not supporting, the, I, I would like to, to say that we are not supporting the regime. We are supporting the Geneva Accords. We are supporting uh, the necessity to launch peaceful dialogue between all parties included to make uh, Bashar al-Assad not a part of problem, but a part of solution. And uh, if we take, if we come back to the but Boston Treaty, do, do, do you honestly, do you think the Russian government honestly believes that Assad can be any, can be part of any solution after two years of this reality on the ground? Well, we have a lot of uh, different examples in our history. Look at Cambodia, where the Khmer Rouge are still there and uh, still enjoy their peaceful life. And uh, we have more, more examples of that. And if we come back to the Boston tragedy, we can see that the terrorists who committed this ugly crime, they are fed by, by, by not by the, by the Syria, because the United States uh, helps the Syrian opposition. And it's a very, so I, I recognize that it's a clear position, but uh, they are So, so could, I, yeah. could I phrase it this way? If I understand the way, and I'm, of course you're not representing the Russian government, but you're sure. helping us understand the Russian perspective, which I have to admit is not voiced enough in our, in our, in our, um, in Israel, not in the media, I don't right. think it also, so, you're saying that if anyone can think of a solution that does not include Assad in any way, Russia will not back that solution? Is that, is that the right way to understand what you're saying? I think the right way to understand the reality in Syria is that we have a very strong and uh, cohesive army and security apparatus, which are together, which are still fighting against any sort of opposition, which is bad. Because probably uh, we, we would like to have more reconciliatory approach on both sides. And we're in favor of that. We're pressuring Assad. We're pressuring, we've been pressuring Assad for reforms for very, 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 in a very strong manner. But at the same time, we know that if the regime collapses, all these minorities, especially these Alawites, uh, will be immediately physically eliminated. They know that. For them, it's a battle for survival. They are ready to, to, to fight until the uh, very last minute in their lives. We have this re a reality, very sad reality. We care. We have also about very, a lot of very special concerns in Syria. We have Orthodox Christians there who are not in favor of, of, of Assad, but they are not in favor of supporting their position. A lot of Orthodox Christians. We have uh, about 100,000 Circassians who are also who have been loyal to the regime. We have 150,000 Armenians who have been loyal to the regime as well and who are fleeing, just leaving the country in, in, in large uh, numbers. And we have very special responsibilities and concern about their fate. That's, that's uh, very interesting. I wasn't aware of, of that, I must admit. But I want to I move on to Ambassador uh, Levit. 
going back to, to Libya, it was quite clear the, um, that Obama, President Obama was in the back seat and in the front seat was uh, Sarkozy, and you were very close to Sarkozy in those uh, days. Um, I guess it's quite clear it's not the case in Syria, not with uh, France and not with Hollande in, in, in the, in the, um, in the Elysee. Why is there such a big difference? Is it because what people might say, well, you know, Libya has oil and refugees are coming to Europe and it's not that case with Syria? No, I don't think so. First, I'm delighted to participate in this debate. And congratulations to uh, General Amos Yadlin. Great man and great speech. Thank you very much. Second. You know what? Applause. That's. <laughs> second, uh, I participated with uh, Sarkozy in the great adventure in Libya. There is a unanimous decision which has been taken by the UN which is called the responsibility to protect. What does it mean? And it was approved by Russia and China. It means that when in a country the government, the leaders are not protecting their population but massacring, massacring, fighting their own population, then it is the responsibility of the United Nations to protect the population. That's exactly what happened in Libya when Gaddafi started bombing his own population. So with David Cameron, Sarkozy took the initiative of this war. I think it was successful. First, because we were in a position to protect the population. Second, at the end of the day, uh, Gaddafi was gone not the way we wanted. We wanted him in the Hague to... It, it is the Middle East after all. You can't expect but, everything. Yeah. And by the way, the Khmer Rouge are in jail in Cambodia thanks to the UN intervention. But uh, there is a big difference. Uh, the difference is that uh, first we have uh, two vetoes, three vetoes in the UN Security Council and we have to respect international law Second, we have a big debate in Europe these days because we have imposed an embargo, arms embargo, on Syria. So we are split in the middle in the European Union between, let's say, Germany, Sweden, few others who don't want any arms to be delivered to the opposition, and uh, Cam uh, Cameron and Hollande who, wants, uh, who want to uh, deliver arms. And their point, and I'm 100% with them, their point is as follows. Why should we allow Russia and Iran to massively equip with the best armaments the bloody government of Bashar al-Assad? Why should we accept that Saudi Arabia and Qatar are delivering massively arms to the most Islamic of the fighters and we would refrain from helping those who are closest to our views. So I think it's very important that at the end of the embargo, which is end of May, in one month, a decision is taken to at least allow those who want in Europe to train and equip the decision which was mentioned by David Ignatius is a good start, but we should go beyond. And I think that when uh, President Putin will understand that this time really rebellion, uh, those who are fighting uh, for freedom and simply their lives uh, are well equipped and will win, then maybe there will be a negotiation. I agree uh, with Professor Naukin. Uh, what we need is to maintain the state structures because we need to protect the minorities. Here we are in agreement and in Iraq it was a big mistake uh, to disband the state structures. But beyond well what we army, need... As well as the army. And, 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 and the army, the state... The party and the Ba'ath Party. Yes, of course. I agree with that. But not with Bashar al-Assad and his clan and family. Because never ever those who are seeing the bombs flowing over their heads, killing their children, will accept to negotiate and maintain Bashar al-Assad. So there is a way forward. 
through negotiation, but we should first make sure that there is agreement, Assad must go. Okay, so I want to talk to you about red line, not about Iran. We'll get there in a minute. I just want to understand one thing about the, um, quickly about the um, red line regarding Syria, because as a matter of fact, I think it was in the press conference with Benjamin Netanyahu at the residence in Jerusalem where Obama was asked by my, I think it was my colleague, Udi Segal, who asked the question regarding the use of chemical weapons, and there President Obama said that would be a red line. David Ignatius, we understand President Obama is not going to start a new war. There are not going to be boots on the ground. What does he mean when he says that the chemical weapons are a red line? What should we expect? Well, we don't know um, because he didn't say. He said it's a red line. Uh, evidence has been asserted that that red line has been crossed, that chemical weapons has been, have been used, and the United States has essentially been silent about it. Um, but what, what, do you think, what, what do you think could be accept, expected? I mean... So, when when so, we know he's not going to send boots, uh, you know, troops, so what could he do? Would so he militarily let a, intervene? Let me make a couple of comments. One area in which U.S. and Russian cooperation is essential is in dealing with the problem of serious chemical weapons. And at about the same time that President Obama announced his red line, we're told that the Russians privately, but very forcefully, communi communicated to President uh, Assad and his group that they also strongly insisted that chemical weapons should not be used. So we have the same interest that these weapons not be used, that they not proliferate. And in fact, when Vice President Biden met with Soviet uh, Russian Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov in Munich, they talked about ways they could uh, cooperate together. One reason that people should uh, be interested in this new plan to train elements of the moderate Syrian opposition is that part of that program that was just agreed yesterday in Istanbul is to train elite forces, these commandos, that will, will have training in the handling and disposal of chemical weapons. That's part of the idea of this force, that if Assad falls, there will be some people who can move in quickly, hopefully with support from the outside, to secure the weapons. Is that, is that the red line also for Moscow? Are we, are we hitting a, a mutual red line? Does Assad know that if he uses those chemical weapons, he's losing Russian support? Does he know that for a fact? For sure, I'm, I agree with this uh, assumption that it's uh, it's really a red line. I think nobody will be allowed to use chemical weapons from both sides. But I have one small comment about the the fact that uh, so to, to Jean David, you know, about this uh, best equip best armaments that are given to Syria. I have much doubts. I think General Yadlin can confirm that, that Syria doesn't have any best weapons in the region. First and second, if you if you are saying that you are equipping uh, their position with the weapons because of these certain values. Why don't you give weapons to those who are fighting for the same values somewhere in the Gulf states, for instance? Okay, but... I, okay, so let, let's move on to... Is that a serious proposal? <laughs> yeah. It's very really serious. Open another battleground. Okay, well, I mean, if you want to distribute weapons to extremists, they're going to stand no, in line. I, you know, you no, be I, careful. No, I, I will simply say uh, to you, my friend, there is a big difference using bombs from planes, from tanks, from guns, uh, and maintaining law and order in a way which is brutal. Uh, when you use these weapons... Uh, against your own people, then uh, you have to go. That's as simple as that. Okay. okay. Let's, let's, because time is running out, so let mo let's move on to Iran. And I got, want to start with you, Professor Namkin. Um, and, I mean, we look at the international community. It seems like everyone is on the same page when it comes to preventing Iran from having a nuclear bomb. And although that after this round of negotiations of the P5 plus 1, Russia is indeed on the same page. I'm going to ask it very bluntly. There is a sense of feeling that Moscow and Putin and Russia um, are not as shocked by the idea that the Ayatollahs would have a red button of their own. No, I think uh, 
Well, our leaders made uh, more than one statement about the fact that the nuclear Iran is unacceptable for Russia. But I can acknowledge that probably the feeling of vulnerabil vulnerability uh, or, or the feeling of these uh, threats coming from this proliferation are probably l less stronger, less important for Russia as in comparison with the United States probably. But at the same time, some people believe that Iran will be not less responsible for Pakistan uh, than Pakistan, for instance, that has nuclear weapons. And on the other hand, uh, we are cooperating very closely with the West, with the United States, with the Europeans, in pressuring Iran, in trying to find solutions. But again, uh, here one of the motivations where probably we have differences with our Western partners is that we are against use of force in, in uh, putting pressures on Iran, in preventing uh, Iran to acquire uh, nuclear weapons where we don't have still a smoking gun for But this. when push comes to shove, if there will be the dilemma, bomb or bombing, will Russia go ahead with all options are on the table? I don't think so. I, I think that I believe that Russia uh, as, uh, will not be uh, one of the actors in uh, playing this role and uh, but uh, again we're not in favor of a nuclear Iran, uh, but as you, as you know, there are a lot of people who, not only in, in Europe, but even in the United States, who are saying, for instance, as for instance, uh, Professor Waltz in his famous article in Foreign Policy, that probably the nuclear parity between Israel and uh, Iran in the Middle East would be an important uh, pillar of security. Um. Ambassador uh, Levitt, how would that, how would this Russian um, uh, stand influence France, for example, when I'm taking you to the edge, when push comes to shove, bomber yeah. bombing? Yeah. Well, first, I think the negotiations will fail. Why? Because for two decades and more, Iran is investing in uh, building the bomb. Second, uh, they look at North Korea. North Korea had three uh, nuclear testings and the regime is still there and there are sanctions taken by the Security Council. Okay, uh, it's a laugh. So, uh, I think they will go down the road and they will try to get it. Then you have three possibilities which were mentioned by uh, Amos. Uh, either you accept the nuclear Iran, it's a disaster because as he said, then uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, uh, will get the bomb, and it's the end of the non-proliferation treaty. The second possibility is for Israel to strike. It's a disaster also because it will mean that the whole Muslim world will be behind the leaders of Iran, uh, and that's not what we want. Uh, we want to separate Iran from Syria, from Hezbollah, and so on. Uh, and the it's not quite sure that Saudi Arabia would be behind Iran, but I think that's, they'll talk about it tomorrow. Yeah, okay, we'll talk about it tomorrow. But the third possibility, as it was mentioned, is for the U.S. to do the job. And here I'd like to open up to another possibility, despite what uh, Professor uh, Nomkin said. When I was with Sarkozy at the Elysee, we pushed hard and with success for more sanctions. Not a drop of oil should be bought by European countries from Iran. And we should kill the banking system of Iran. And the European Union adopted these sanctions. And my Israeli counterpart at the time came to my office and said, why are you doing all this for us? It's wonderful. And I said, look, we love you, but we are not doing this for you. We are doing this for us, because we really don't want Iran to become a nuclear power. And my point is that as we are negotiating, as the P5, the five permanent members of the Security Council and, and uh, Germany, if we are together during this negotiation, we should stay together if and when it fails. And I'm sure that if we are together to threaten seriously Iran from bombing P5 plus one, 
Then Khamenei will say, okay, I'll drink the poison uh, glass like Khomeini decades ago. And he would sign not to have the bombing. Uh, that's my recommendation. Let's consider to be together, not only during the negotiation, but beyond the negotiation, if need be. Well, it's interesting. We can understand the differences here. Um, uh, David, I think the, the most, I think the, the number one question in this room is, as um, General Yadlin said, what will President Obama do? And um, y you, you wrote in your article um, um, from April 4th that the big question is whether America war weariness will undermine Obama's pledge to use military force if necessary to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. That is the big question in the room. Well, uh, the f first thing I want to say is that whenever I want to understand uh, Iran better, I go see Amos Yadlin and come to this center. And I've quoted his views, and I want to quote in particular what he said earlier when he had his four T's. One of those T's was trauma, the trauma that America feels after this decade of very difficult wars. President Obama was reelected voicing that national war weariness, no more, no more wars. That said, I do not believe that an American president can make a public promise that he will prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and not carry it out. I think if an American president is seen to be bluffing in that kind of statement, uh, that's something the country can't recover from. The problem is that the Iranians don't believe him. The Iranians are convinced that he won't do this. Uh, and I think going forward, that's the most dangerous thing. The Iranians are so convinced that uh, Obama wouldn't do it, he'd be crazy to do it. I interviewed Ahmadinejad in New York uh, when he came to the General Assembly last September. He kept going on about, you're so war weary, this war, these wars bankrupted you, you're not crazy enough to attack Iran. They really believe that. And somehow, I think this goes to the heart of the next six months, somehow, uh, the United States and its allies, including Israel, have to convince Iran that that calculation is wrong and it's going to lead them to disaster. It's not a question of disaster for us, it's disaster for them. And I think unity um, of the P5 plus one in some ways is the most important element. Iran still believes that Russia will save us, China will save us, and to the extent the signal is sent that the P5 plus one remains united even as things get more tense, I think that could make a difference. Okay, um, we're out of time and I want to thank you so much for your uh, candid remarks and for your enlightening um, uh, conversation. I think we learned a lot and we saw indeed that what you see from there is not what you see from here and we have a new government and we can see how these uh, things uh, unfold but we have the same Prime Minister and almost the same uh, players in, in the region so it's going to be interesting how they will play these uh, crucial coming months. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time and being with us and thank you uh, very much and I turn the floor back to Mayor.